Good morning everyone, I'm Gilles, one of the logistic officers based at uh, Global Logistic Cluster. First of all, thank you for your participation during the two sessions of one hour each on Monday and Tuesday. The content of the two sessions can be summarized as follows. The first will be the perspectives and plan for 2021, which was also present during the last global logistic meeting in October 2020. Second is how in the long term can we address the humanitarian logistic challenges beyond the presence of the logistic cluster. In this regard, we propose you to go through some of the logistic cluster long-running operation, such as Central Africa and Nigeria on Monday, South Sudan and Syria on Tuesday, and then we would like to hear from you. Here is a short overview of some aspects that we would like to share with you on the logistic cluster operations and perspectives for 2021. This year, the gap and needs analysis in existing and future operations will continue to be developed. The general objective of the GNA is to assess existing and potential logistic gaps, constraints and needs for which the logistic cluster support might be requested by partners. GNA provides the rationale on the potential need of a cluster activation or of an alternative coordination mechanism endorsed by the humanitarian community. Since January 2021, GNA have been conducted in Myanmar, Venezuela, and uh, is currently taking place in Syria. In addition to the above, we have also planned a review of our response strategy in countries where the context and the needs have evolved, such as in Bangladesh, DRC, Pacific region and Yemen. In this regard, we would like to propose to have a quarterly global call on operations with partners who wish to be engaged at global level in the strategic review of logistic cluster country operation. This global call can include any operation and country where the logistic cluster is present. Here is the second key point of this session. We would like to hear from you as participants your views on the strategy and response in long-running operations, more than one year and more, including in protracted crises like in Central Africa, Nigeria, South Sudan and Syria. How, in the long term, can we address the humanitarian logistics challenges beyond the presence of a logistic cluster. In this regard, we propose presentation by logistic cluster field teams of some of the long-running operations and the respective challenges identified by the teams and partners in four countries, Central Africa and Nigeria on Monday, South Sudan and Syria on Tuesday. Then we would like to hear from you, participants, and to know your view on possible opportunities for transition during and beyond the presence of a logistic cluster, possible opportunities for localization, other opportunities. To do so, we'll have space for discussion after the presentation made by field teams, which is following. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gilles, and uh, we can see you there. So you'll be ready to help answer some questions uh, after the next two presentations. So the first one um, is, from the Central African Republic, and uh, it's been pre-recorded by Virginie Angers, uh, the Logistics Cluster Coordinator, and Audrey Pereira, who's the Information Management Officer. So 
Let's uh, see what they've had to say about the last year. Hello, everybody. We are the logistics cluster for the Central African operation. Um, it's been activated in 2013. And in the first part, we propose to briefly review the existing logistics gaps and then the gaps coverage implemented up to today. And finally, we'd like to think together with you about some interrogations we are still facing about a decade after uh, its activation, together with some potential lead for 2021. The first logistics gap we are reviewing here is the lack of coordination mechanisms at national level among the humanitarian actors and with relevant stakeholders at large. A various strains should be considered on the scarce logistics capacity available for the humanitarian actors. And so the lack of good coordination mechanisms in country results in less efficiency in the humanitarian response. Even worse, humanitarian actors may not see the point of sharing information and assets and could also lack visibility on resources uh, availability. Therefore, the concept of networking has proven to be essential as it is part of the cluster spirit in the capital as well as in the fields to connect actors and resources. In this line, the cluster co-facilitation is of added value to understand humanitarian actors' strength and encourage resources and information sharing. When the network is strong, field actors in the region particularly turn to the cluster cell in Bengi uh, for information and problem solving. Moving on, there is a great need for appropriate and harmonized logistics information sharing mechanisms in downstream logistics. This includes, for example, dynamic updates on access maps, updates on administrative and customs procedures, which is particularly useful in the Central African context, as the turnover of logistics staff is really high and procedures are complex and changing. In a nutshell, a dedicated information management officer ultimately allows to maintain the information flow and to produce the most relevant possible products. Besides, the role is useful to promote logistic services, including road, air transport and storage common services that the cluster can provide and to connect partners with assets available. The way forward as we see it is twofold. First, we need a better understanding and visibility on local services and goods to strengthen a network of quality local suppliers. Second, we need to improve our physical access expertise. These require a collective effort for systematic information sharing in a community, together with the cluster as an essential hub for collecting, analyzing and sharing accurate information. The role of the information management officer might be misunderstood or under, underestimated, and we think it would be worth promoting it to encourage best practices for a better understanding of information needs in country. The gaps currently addressed by the common logistics services are first the physical accessibility, which is a key factor in delivering aid to the most vulnerable. Successive crises and environmental hazards, which we know are endemic in Central Africa, have dramatically deteriorated the already limited access infrastructures across the country, isolating entire groups of population. Currently, the maintenance of those infrastructures consists of rehabilitation projects led by a limited, very limited number of actors who lack the capacity, the funding and the protection to act. In addition, only quick fixes, so very short term rehabilitations are being done. It results in long delays to complete the projects and only a few locations in the critical eastern part of the country are concerned. In these conditions, there is no 
possibility of stopping the emergency air cargo service and shift to a more sustainable solution until the roads are in better condition. Lots of areas remain closed off during the rainy season, which means many groups of endangered population receive little to no aid for many months. A second, these access constraints are combined with a structurally inadequate logistics capacity in country, one of the most critical in the world, and humanitarian actors hardly find quality logistics services, equipment, and assets on the local market. Moreover, there is a great need to strengthen technical competencies of national logisticians, as it is the condition to improve the overall quality of logistics services. We are also seeing a very high turnover of expatriates and gaps, as well as difficulties to navigate um, through the national bureaucracy, which increases the already significant vulnerability. Lastly, on this verified gap section, a main gap identified was the critically low level of local logistics and technical services. It was therefore planned to deliver various logistics trainings to ultimately improve the quality of services. It's a long-term process which needs to be maintained, renewed and adapted to the changing local situation in order to bring in a real added value. As the COVID-19 pandemic hit Central Africa in 2020, a possible solution was thought to be online trainings, but we did not see it as very relevant. Logistics trainings could only bring value with humanitarian actors actually performing stock inventories, for example. For a year now, the logistics cluster has not organized trainings in Bengi nor on the field, and therefore, the capacity building gap hasn't been covered properly. In 2021, we need to plan in consideration of the sanitary and security situation by setting up a system that allows training to be done in prisons. Lastly, Looking at our concept of operations as it is today, the coordination is an essential element of the logistics cluster mandate to promote joint planning and at the same time improve the analysis of logistics needs. The cluster is also the first point of contact to liaise with national authorities and the private sector in order to help the humanitarian community further. In this line, to develop stronger common services and coordination strategies to cope with the well-known logistics structural deficiencies in Central Africa, the cluster has launched logistics groups in the field. Those are enablers for the mutualization of assets and harmonization of practices. Currently, we have active groups in Bria, Bangassou, Pawa, and newly in Bois. The cluster is a reference for the humanitarian community as it masters the strengths of each NGOs through the gaps and needs analysis, and by regularly assessing the logistical capacities in country through the logistics capacity assessments. As such, it should be the first point of contact for newcomers as well. Uh, briefly reviewing the common logistics services, we start with the storage. Uh, in Bengi, we have two warehouses that are managed by uh, the partner Premier Urgence on behalf of the cluster to provide storage space. In addition, nine MSUs, mobile storage units, uh, free to users, uh, have been made available across the country, as you can see it on the map, managed by different INGS partners uh, based on their capacity and field presence. On the transport side, humanity and inclusion on behalf of the cluster, coordinates a common road transport service from Bengi, Bambari, and Bosangwa to various hotspots around the country. Lastly, in order to support the emergency operations of organizations working with the population most severely affected uh, by shocks, uh, whatever they are security, natural or epidemic driven, the logistics cluster facilitates an emergency air freight service to the hard to reach destinations by road, so mainly in the east and northeast uh, part of the country. 
Now for 2021, we need to consider the changes in the local situation. COVID-19 and the rise of insecurity due to the presidential election in December 2020 have complexified even more the response. Concretely, bottlenecks at the Cameronese border and sanitary restrictions limiting field presence continue to impact operations and acts of banditry against humanitarian actors on the roads have multiplied controlling access um, with illegal checkpoints. Considering the logistics cluster will focus on the gaps and needs analysis in 2021, which will help uh, identifying priorities. Moreover, we should think about facilitating more trainings for national staff and we will work on strengthening a network of quality local suppliers via the logistics capacity assessment. And um, lastly, the main consideration for the log cluster in 2021 will be the coordination and advocating for a more local approach to logistics services. This goes hand in hand with our last point for you, which is about the leads for 2021 we chose to highlight in this uh, global logistics meeting. So out of the seven questions that the global logistics meeting is considering, these three questions um, arise at country level. We would like to start thinking about one in particular um, on how we might approach capacity strengthening in this long running operation. So out of the seven questions that the global logistics meeting is considering, these three questions um, arise at country level. We would like to start thinking about one in particular um, on how we might approach capacity strengthening in this long running operation. So the question we ask is uh, how can we work toward a more local approach to the humanitarian response in Central Africa? The first area to focus on consists of uh, the considerable gap uh, in resources between national and international NGOs, leaving national NGOs on the sideline. Could the logistics cluster strengthen its networking approach to be more inclusive? And to enable this, do we have a more important role to play in technical or fundraising advocacy assistance? After all, isn't it the national NGOs that could increase the quality of the response? We should try to foresee the role they could play in the medium term with training and support services. In this same spirit, we need to assess to what extent the establishment of funded support services, road, air transport, for example, could encourage local investments for national NGOs, but also for local commercial companies. Do they currently have the space to develop and grow? We would very much appreciate your insights on those questions. Thank you very much for your attention. This is the end of our presentation. Thus, uh, the question we ask is how can we work toward a strengthened local approach so the to question the humanitarian we response is, in uh, how Africa. can we work? So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, we will be debating those questions after the next presentation. Uh, thank you for giving your insights into what's obviously been a very tough year and it doesn't look like getting any less challenging in 2021. Um, so we'll just now hear the presentation from uh, Nigeria and then we will have open it up to the floor. Uh, would welcome all your suggestions in a debate. So over now to Mushin Mufti, who's the logistics cluster coordinator for Nigeria. The logistics cluster in Nigeria, or logistics sector, as it is known in the country, was activated by the IASC in mid-2016 in response to a swelling population displacement caused by the conflict between the Nigerian armed forces and a growing number of non-state armed groups. 
the logistics cluster in Nigeria. As part of the sector's operations, the gaps and needs in its area of operation are frequently reviewed. The gaps identified during the last review exercise can be classified into four categories. One of the major gaps identified in Northeast Nigeria was the lack of coordination between and within government agencies and humanitarian organizations. Government agencies have little or no presence in key areas of operations of humanitarian actors. This leads to a disunited approach to resolving logistics gaps in the affected parts of the country. It was also observed that humanitarian organizations had challenges with certain requirements set by the Nigerian military and were unable to properly advocate for a change to ease their operating environment. There was also little coordination at the local government level between government and humanitarian organizations and between humanitarians working at different locations across the Northeast. There was also limited knowledge regarding the available vendors in the country, and most organizations had limited contact with vendors outside the Northeast. This resulted in organizations dealing with vendors who were engaged at the beginning of their operations in the region, who might provide low quality and high cost goods, the unnecessary importation of goods, or forced dependence of the organizations on the logistics sector for services. The movement of cargo to areas of operation has been a serious challenge for humanitarian organizations. This is due to the insecurity along the routes, as well as lengthy bureaucratic processes put in place by the Nigerian military. For areas requiring armed escorts, there is limited capacity of the military to provide regular escorts for the movement of humanitarian cargo. Another challenge was the logistics infrastructure and services. There was limited availability of suitable warehouse spaces which could be used by humanitarian organizations in most of the operational locations. This is due to most of the sites never having such structures in the first place or the structures being irreparably destroyed by the conflict. The availability of suitable transport providers was also observed to be a challenge, with several transporters not meeting the criteria and needs of humanitarian organizations. It was also observed that there was a lack of knowledge of logistics best practices among staff of humanitarian organizations, especially in areas regarding vendor management. The With the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic, additional strain was placed on the already fragile logistics infrastructure. With increased difficulties in the processes required for the movement of cargo, importation of goods, and the cost of goods and services. The growing insecurity in the region has also greatly impacted the ability of humanitarians to transport cargo. Illegal vehicle checkpoints set up by non-state armed groups have resulted in the looting of cargo and abduction of drivers. The insecurity has also resulted in the need for exceptional armed escorts on routes which were previously considered safe. This has led to additional delays in the movement of cargo. Some of the services provided by the logistics sector have also been impacted by the declining security situation, with common storage sites having to close down for days due to security reasons. With that, in order to fill the gaps identified, the logistics sector carries out key activities to support the operations of humanitarian organizations. First and foremost is coordination. The logistics sector helps coordinate the activities of humanitarian actors 
Northeast Nigeria by creating a platform and engaging regularly with humanitarian logisticians to understand their needs, share best practices, and lessons learned. The sector also helps to consolidate humanitarian road cargo movement requests in coordination with the Nigerian Armed Forces and requests for light cargo movement in coordination with UNHAS. The sector also liaises with authorities and relevant national and international parties on behalf of the humanitarian community to raise any logistics issues of common concern including customs and logistics access constraints. Updated information is shared on logistics capacity at different locations, expected humanitarian pipelines, humanitarian access, national and state regulations affecting supply chain, as well as information on vendors. The logistics sector has set up and maintains common storage facilities across Borno State in key locations which were identified by humanitarian organizations. These common warehouses provide free-to-user storage in locations where no warehouse capacity is available for humanitarians to use. In other locations, the sector enhances storage capacity of organizations through the loan of mobile storage units. The sector also provides air cargo consolidation services to serve as an organized system for the movement of light cargo through UNHAS helicopters. The logistics sector provides focus trainings on logistics to enhance the capacity of staff of humanitarian organizations and government emergency response agencies. In order to fill the gaps identified, the logistics in order to fill the gaps identified in keeping in mind that the aim of the sector is only to serve as a last resort until there is capacity locally to sustain the humanitarian operations, there is the need to determine a way forward for the response. One of the ways to reduce dependency of humanitarian organizations and the government on the sector and to ensure independence and sustainability of aid operations is to create capacity of the local actors to develop and manage logistics solutions. Here are some of the areas to consider and thinking of capacity development for humanitarians and the government. What supply and logistics competencies can be usefully addressed in a common setting? That is, contracting and procurement rules are organization specific. However, principles of contracting and procurement may be more universal. What supply and logistics competencies can support a transition away from the sector approaches towards broader solutions and greater autonomy. That is, if controlling costs through collective approaches or economies of scale is a main concern, how can we support groups of organizations in setting this up themselves? How does capacity strengthening and localization in the context of the cluster approach for logistics as a service cluster differ from what is can or should be expected of programmatic clusters. So thank you very much. Um, it would be good if uh, the contributors there, Virginie Angers, uh, Gilles and uh, Mushin Mufti, if you're there, um, you could switch your cameras on and uh, we can put some of the questions that are coming in to you. Um, Virginie, uh, thank you very much and Mushin, welcome. Um, so Virginie, uh, there's a question that's come in and I actually, it, it was a point you made in your presentation which really stood out uh, for me, which was um, about the fact that you've not had any online training um, last year. And, um, 
that's just due to COVID-19. So I just, I just wondered, you know, is that the main reason? Uh, do you think you can actually implement training in the next year as you indicated you want to? Hi, everybody. Um, so it's a good question. Um, indeed, we we uh, we couldn't uh, organize a proper formation last year, and even our partners who were supposed to do it uh, before because of COVID nineteen. Uh, we hope this uh, this year we will be able to organize them, and uh, it's more even complicated in car because of uh, lack of internet connectivity, and the partners who, which has the most um, needs in trainings are the the local NGO, and the lack of connectivity are even uh, higher. Thank you. Thank you, and. Um... Uh, I also picked up on the fact that, um, you know, the holy grail, of course, is more localization for everybody. But I think people will will recognize that um, that's very difficult. And of course, uh, Moshin Mufti, you picked out the fact that the security situation is deteriorating uh, in all these places where there has been a protracted crisis and protracted operations. It's partly because of the deteriorating security situation. So um, I just wondered how you can see a way forward, really, in, in terms of implementing further localization and strengthening of local capacity. Um, that's a good point to raise, actually. And I think localization is probably one of the solutions to the security um, situation getting worse in, in the region. Um, there are a number of places in the country in the northeast of Nigeria where local actors are able to reach and access and international and UN organizations are not. Um, the building capacity of those local actors is more important than ever at this point um, because they are able to get get what is needed, get the aid to those people that are in need. Um, so when you're talking about um, you know, transitioning uh, capacity into those people, then you have to, you have to think about uh, what exactly it is that they need to move away from dependency on the logistics uh, cluster or sector. Um, so those are the kind of aspects that we feel capacity should be built on uh, because our approach should not be to continue to um, operate and support in a protracted crisis, however, to serve as uh, the you know, provision of last resort when um, there's an emergency, when there's emerging needs as well. So when things stabilize to some extent or are predictable to some extent, we should be able to create capacity of the local actors and take a step back to see how uh, they are able to operate. Thank you. So um, everybody watching, um, we would really uh, welcome your interventions. So if you have a question, do uh, in the chat, uh, raise your hand, uh, just as in the session before. We would like to hear your voices. We'd like to see you if possible, uh, if you have something to add or if you have um, a question to the local coordinators here who've uh, given us their very frank um, uh, reports of the year and showed all the gaps and uh, we would welcome your thoughts in how to plug those gaps. Um, Gilles, do you do you have any um, thoughts having watched those two presentations on ways forward and, and in terms of localization? Uh, yeah, on our side, what really would like we would like uh, to take the opportunity of this uh, global meeting is first to to see with partners how uh, they can be engaged at a global level in the strategic review of, uh, of the countries. As we said in, during the first presentation, there is the, what we suggest to organize first is a quarterly uh, consultation with partners at global level, but not limited to this. We have to think about 
different way for partners to have the possibility to bring ideas, recommendation regarding the review of the strategy in countries. And then as well, to think about uh, beyond the strategy, certain problematic. We spoke about just now uh, about the training. Uh, training is the, let's say, somewhere is the end of something. When you have training, first you evaluate, you have a pedagogic objective for the training. What do we want in certain countries? What do we want to address? We want to improve the operational capacity of the national actors, like in DRC, Central Africa, where we know that there are many national actors and local NGOs. Do we want to, to address this? Or do we want the, to address on a parallel way as well their skills and knowledge of the logistics? So it's really there are different when we speak about capacity building, in fact, it's really huge in terms of uh, components. So, uh, but uh, to come back on the ID, we really like, would like to hear during today, it's limited time, and uh, tomorrow, because tomorrow we have the same session, one hour, we'll be presenting uh, my colleagues from uh, the field will present South Sudan and Syria, and will continue as well the, the discussion, yeah? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to see some hands go up. You're all being very um, recalcitrant, shall we say, or shy. Um, so the first question, do partners wish to be engaged at a global level in the strategic reviews of country operations? Does does anyone feel that they would like to uh, comment on that? Or uh, do partners see a role for um, the logistics cluster operation within the triple nexus of development, humanitarian response and peace? And how do the partners view the current approach to co-facilitation and co-leadership? Um, it, it would be good to see some hands raised. Um, well, no hands are raised at the moment. So I just, I've got my two local candidates there, Mushin and Virginie. Um, how helpful do you think it would be for uh, sort of a more strategic review of a country at a global level by other partners? Neither, oh, I see Danielle uh, Jorman for UNFPA has raised her hand, Danielle. Thanks. Um, the question that I had was specific to the, the one around the nexus. And I think the point of the conversation, I think in both of these operations has been that they're both protracted and longstanding operations. And I think the idea around how do you sustainably in a way phase out of a cluster is something that is also happening within the programmatic clusters as well as the, I think was said, uh, support cluster by um, was seen. But um, so I think that in terms of what the, the the logistic cluster can do, I think having some common strategies and information sharing between the operations around how to best do that, which can be informed by the wider cluster membership at the global level. So how can we learn from other phased out cluster approaches and different operations, both from logistic, but then also from the programmatic clusters who have similar conversations? Of course, the kind of how do you do capacity building and needs assessment? At what point do you... Uh, not need to do these things anymore. That's common, whether you're talking about logistics or gender-based violence or protection or something like this. Um, and the one other thing is that I think in terms of the involvement of cluster members with country review of country operations, it really depends also on the organizations. For an organization like ours, we are quite small in terms of our management of supply, right? So we have a pretty big oversight around what goes on in the country. So from the headquarter perspective, us knowing what's going on in the countries and also being able to get feedback from our country partners and represent that within the discussions is perhaps more feasible than larger UN or INGO organizations. And then also for local actors that don't have that necessarily that voice um, at the global level, how can they constructively contribute to those conversations will need to be considered when you're arranging these kinds of global calls. Thanks. 
Would anyone else like to comment on uh, Danielle's uh, intervention there? Do you want to come back on that? Um, there is a question that's come into the chat from Penny Chikumba from uh, uh, WFP Logistics. And um, she's asking, did the cluster sector have exit strategies in the original design of the interventions? Um, how are government and local level stakeholders engaged in implementing the work to enable transition with exit of the cluster? So basically, um, you know, was an extra strategy prepared before people went in and uh, what's being done to uh, facilitate that? I, would anyone like to comment on that? Uh, Gilles, if not uh, you, perhaps one of the other local representatives. Yes, Mushin? Um, yeah, I think that's actually a very good question. And uh, I think it also depends on the the crisis that the cluster is um, going in or being activated to resolve. So um, with some where uh, it's an, um, let's say a natural disaster, for example, uh, there's already a state emergency management agency. Uh, and then you, uh, you go in and you already have a counterpart that you're working with in terms of state and local access. Um, so it's easy to identify for a service cluster like logistics uh, who their state counterpart is. However, for some other crises and situations, such as the uh, unique situation uh, we have in Nigeria, for example, where um, the, the state is actually a part of the, to the conflict mm -hmm. that we're in, um, it becomes slightly more difficult. And also there's no, um, distinctive state body that is the counterpart for the logistics uh, cluster in this country, uh, in this context. So for us, um, phasing out uh, operations would actually mean, uh, unlike some of the programmatic clusters, which have a straight one-to-one -one relation with some of the government ministries, and uh, what they were trying to do is to build a certain capacity before handing over to their state counterparts, for us would be to build that kind of capacity in the other humanitarian actors working in this region. So um, whereas programmatic uh, clusters will continue to operate and humanitarians will continue to be present in this context for quite some time as, as it seems, um, because um, health crisis, education, shelter will uh, be seem to be protracted here, but we need to be able to make sure that those actors who are working on those elements are enabled enough to be con to continue to operate without needing us to to be there and to be uh, you know helping them out to intervene. So it's a little bit different for us where our active strategy is not really uh, handing over to the government here because um, government agencies don't really exist in some of these regions and also there's not a clear um, demarcation in the government as to who is responsible, but rather. Uh, making sure that organizations are able to continue their operations on their own uh, without requiring us to step in uh, and intervene and provide those services. Thank you very much. If anyone else wants to comment on that, please raise your hand. I can see Leonardo Maria Palma has. Um, hello. Hello, good evening. Can hello. you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. Okay, I would like just to highlight one point that I'm sure that everybody already has you know, in his mind, but uh, I didn't see in the presentation and uh, I would like just to speak about Central Africa 